All right, good morning. Any questions you have before we get right into lecture? All right, so I wanna send out a reminder that you have two MyLab homeworks due this Friday night. They're on sections 5.3, diagonalization, and section 6.1, which is what we'll do today. All right, so just don't forget those are due by midnight. All right, so we are going to move into chapter six today, which is all about orthogonality. The idea here is that we're gonna start working our way back towards solving systems of equations. And if you have an inconsistent system, you know, one without a solution, you can still ask, you know, what's the best approximate solution? You know, what's closest to being a solution? In order to do that, though, we're going to need a notion of closeness. We're also going to need a concept of length and perpendicular vectors for higher dimensions. All right, so that's the plan for today is to build up that background. It all starts with the dot product, which is something we've been using a lot these days to do matrix products. All right, but I want to go back and just start from there. So let's let u and v be vectors in Rn. Then the dot product, also called the inner product or the scalar product of u and v is denoted u dot v. And it's equal to u1 v1 plus u2 v2 sum up to un vn. We can also think of it as a product of a row vector u1 up to un and a column vector v1 to vn. If you were to multiply those two vectors together, you would end up with a you know, single one by one matrix whose entry was the dot product of the two vectors. Another way of writing that then is to take u transpose v. Since we're always assuming our vectors are column vectors, the transpose of a vector would be a row. All right, so another way we'll denote the dot product from now on is u transpose v. All right, so let's do an example quick. Compute u dot v and v dot u for the given vectors. So let's take u dot v or u transpose v. That's equal to the product of the row vector 2 minus 5 minus 1 and the column vector 3, 2, negative 3. Multiplying the individual entries, we've got 2 times 3 plus negative 5 times 2 plus negative one times negative three or negative one. Right. We'll do it in a second, but what would you expect to get for v dot u? The same answer. Yeah. yeah, the order should not matter. Right? If we take v dot u, so v transpose with u, and switch so that we're taking a row vector v transpose and a column vector u, we still get 6 minus 10 plus 3 or negative 1. Good. All right, so this leads us to a couple properties of the dot product. I'm going to let u, v, and w all be vectors in Rn and c be some scalar. Then order doesn't matter. u dot v is equal to v dot u. And that makes sense because everything here is just scalars and order doesn't matter when you're multiplying scalars together. Property two, if you take u dotted with a sum, v plus w, it's equal to u dot v 
plus u dot w. All right, so you can distribute the dot product across sums. Cu dot v is equal to c times u dot v, and that's equal to u dot c v. All right, so when you include a scalar and a dot product, you can associate it with you know, any part you want, with either vector or you can choose to take the dot product and then multiply by the scalar. All works out the same. And then the last property, the zero vector dotted with anything is equal to zero. We're gonna be particularly interested in this section in the dot product of a vector with itself. The length, which we'll denote with two bars on either side of V, of a vector V is the square root of V dot V, or the sum of the components of V squared to the one half power. All right, so to get the length of a vector, we take the inner product of the vector with itself and then the square root of that. Alternatively, an easier way often to write this is the length of V squared is equal to V dot V. All right, let's start off with a quick example. Find the length of the vector 1, 2, 3, 0. The length of V is equal to the square root of V dot V. All right, so we'll take the square root of the sum of the components squared. 1 squared plus 2 squared, 3 squared plus 0 squared. That's root 1 plus 4 plus 9. Or root 14. All right, so we consider the length of that vector to be the square root of 14. Now, this definition of length, it corresponds to our understanding of length in R2 and in R3 that we already have. If I take a vector v equals a b in R2, So it's a vector pointing from the origin to the point AB. I could use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out you know, what I would take the length of that vector to be, you know, just in our normal understanding of length. The length of this side of the triangle is A, this side of the triangle is B, and so the length of the hypotenuse is a root a squared plus b squared. All right, so that would be our typical understanding of length in R2. And it matches up with this notion of length for vectors, right? The length of a vector v here would be the square root of a squared plus b squared, which corresponds to the length of the hypotenuse. Same thing in R3. Taking the length according to this definition, it goes hand in hand with our own geometric understanding of length in R3 that we already had. All right, a couple properties of length here. The first is that the length of a vector is always going to be non-negative. Right? That makes sense. It's a square root, right? but it also makes sense geometrically. We don't typically consider negative lengths. Property two is that the length of a vector v is equal to zero if and only if v is the zero vector. All right, so it makes sense if you have the zero vector, its length is zero, because the sum of the components squared would just be a bunch of zeros. And on the other hand, it's the only vector whose length is equal to zero. Because again, the only way you could get a length equal to zero is if each of the components was zero. So the two bars are just a notation, but you're right in that it does remind us of an absolute value, where for numbers, 
you know, we consider the you know, size of a number to be its absolute value. And here, you know, we're kind of considering the size of the vector to be its length, right? So that's one of the reasons we're using that notation. It's also what's called a norm. Right? And you always use two bars for norms. Does that answer that? Okay. All right, property three is the length of a scalar multiple of V is equal to the absolute value of C times the length of V. So you can pull scalars to the front, but you have to take the absolute value of the scalar. All right, so let's prove that last one. And the way I'm gonna prove it is I'm going to look at the length of CV squared, All right? That way I'm not dealing with any square roots until the end. The length of CV squared is the dot product of CV with itself. And now we can associate the scalars with any part of the dot product, All right? So let's pull both of the C's to the front and have those multiply V dot V or the length of V squared. Now take square roots. On the left side, when I take the square root, I have the length of CV. On the other side, the square root of C squared is absolute C. And then we've got the length of V. All right, so that's where the absolute value of C comes in. All right, so let's look at an example. We've got a vector v, we'll find its length, and then we'll find the length of a scalar multiple of v. All right, the length of v itself is the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. Root 9 plus 1 plus 16, or root 26. And now we'll take the length of minus 5v. Right, what do I have to multiply the length of v by to get the length of minus 5v? Yeah, 5. Good. The absolute value of negative 5 length v is equal to 5 root 26. Good. All right, some more definitions here. A unit vector u is a vector whose length is equal to 1. That is the square root of u dot u is equal to 1, or just u dot u itself is equal to 1. All right, so unit vectors are vectors whose dot product with themselves is equal to 1. If v is a non-zero vector, then we can always define the unit vector in the direction of v. The notation I use is E sub V, and it's equal to one over the length of V times V. All right, this is gonna give you a vector that points in the same direction as V, but also is a unit vector. Right, so if you were to take the length of EV, it would be equal to one. This process of creating EV from a vector v is called normalizing. And in different contexts, it's useful to be working with vectors of length one. We'll see this in a couple sections when we do the Gram-Schmidt method, right? So it's a good idea to have this memorized or at least nearby, you know, how you construct a unit vector from any vector. Let's take an example. So I'm gonna let v be the vector one, negative two, two, zero. Let's find a unit vector that points in the direction of V. All right, so we'll need the length of V. That's a root one plus four plus four or root nine equal to three. So the unit vector in the direction of V is one over the length of V times V itself. 
that's the vector a third minus two thirds, two thirds, zero. All right, let's see a second example. This time I'm going to look at a subspace of R2 spanned by the vector V, which is two thirds, one. So W is equal to span two thirds, one. Let's find a basis for W that's made up of a unit vector. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is rewrite W as the span of a different vector. What could I multiply V by in order to make taking its length easier in a moment, but not change the span? Three. Good. If I multiply by three, then I don't have any fractions. And so when I go to take the length, it's a little bit easier. And the span's not changed because it's still some multiple of our original V. All right now, the length of this new vector is equal to root 2 squared plus 3 squared or root 13. So I can take a unit vector u to be 1 over root 13 times 2, 3. This provides a basis for w right, because it's just a rescaling of the original vector v, right, but now it's a unit vector for the basis. And let's just take a look at geometrically what's happening. Our original vector was 2 thirds 1. There's our v. What's the span? of that vector gonna look like? Geometrically, what's it mapping out? Yeah, it's a line, good. All right, so we've got a line here. And now the only thing we've changed is we've chosen instead of the original vector two thirds one, a unit vector in order to map it out. So we've got a new vector of length one as our choice of basis for that line. Got any questions up to this point on the background type stuff? All right, so now I want to take a moment to talk about angles in R2 and R3, but mostly R2, because these are things that we can visualize. And so we can talk a bit about the meaning behind the dot product and things like that in R2. All right, so let's consider a unit vector in R2. Then a unit vector's head lies on the unit circle in R2. Right, so I'm going to let u be a unit vector. If I were to sketch u, It's heads on the unit circle. And now let's let theta be the angle between u and the positive x axis. Then we have a description for u in terms of theta. U has components cosine theta, sine theta. All right, so unit vectors in R2, we can describe in terms of their angle they make with the positive x-axis. Now let's look at two unit vectors in R2. If U is a vector with components cosine alpha, sine alpha, and V, has components cosine beta, sine beta, our unit vectors in R2. Let's draw a picture here. We 
we've got u and the angle between u and the x-axis is alpha. Another unit vector v that makes an angle beta with the x-axis. Now let's take the dot product of u with v. That's equal to cosine alpha cosine beta plus sine alpha sine beta. Does that look familiar to anyone? Cosine alpha cosine beta plus sine alpha sine beta. All right, it's a trig thing. It's equal to cosine of beta minus alpha. Oh yeah, good, cosine A minus B, very nice. Um, cosine A minus B, cosine B minus A are the same thing because it's an even function. I'm just gonna write it this way because then it's kind of clear that it's cosine of the angle between U and V, which I'll call theta. All right, so if you take the dot product of two unit vectors in R2, it's describing the angle between them. It's equal to cosine of the angle between them. And if we don't have two unit vectors, well, we can just make them unit vectors first. We get what's called the cosine formula. U dot V divided by the length of U times the length of V is equal to cosine theta, where theta is the angle between U and V. All right, so the dividing by the length of U times length of V was the part where I was normalizing and making them unit vectors first. And then if we take the dot product, you would get cosine of the angle between them. Or rearranging the dot product of u and v is equal to the length of u times the length of v times cosine of the angle between them. All right, let's see what this gets us. If u and v are perpendicular, right? so that means you know, they make a right angle with each other or theta is equal to pi over two. Then u dot v is equal to the length of u, the length of v times cosine of pi over two. What's cosine of pi over two? Zero, good, good. So the dot product of perpendicular vectors is equal to zero. And it goes the other way as well. If the dot product between two vectors was zero, then they must have been perpendicular. All right, so the dot product gives us a test for deciding if two vectors are perpendicular. If it's zero, they are. If it's non-zero, then they're not. We even get more than this. The dot product is going to be strictly bigger than zero if and only if cosine of theta is strictly bigger than zero. Because the dot product is equal to the length of u times the length of v, those are both always non-negative. Right? The thing that determines the sine is cosine of theta. All right, so that happens. But now that's only true if theta is between zero and pi over two. Cosine is positive in quadrant one. Or theta is acute. Right, so if your dot product is strictly bigger than zero, that indicates that the angle between your two vectors, u and v, must be an acute angle. They're fairly close together. On the other hand, if the dot product is strictly less than zero, 
then cosine of theta must have been strictly less than zero. And so we're looking at an angle in quadrant two between them, pi over two less than theta, less than or equal to pi. That's an obtuse angle. So if the sine of your dot product is negative, then your angles are fairly far apart. There's an obtuse angle between them. All right, so the sine of the dot product is indicating when an angle is acute, a right angle, or an obtuse angle between the two. As a note here, the cosine formula also holds in R3. Again, it's just easier to visualize in R2, so that's why we proved it in R2. All right, let's use it to classify and then actually find the angle between it a couple pairs of vectors. Let's look at two vectors in R2, 3, 1, and minus 1, minus 2. All right, so we want to get to cosine theta. As part of that, we'll need u dot v, 3 times negative 1 plus 1 times negative 2 is equal to negative 5. We'll also need the length of u. That's a root 9 plus 1, or root 10, and the length of v, a root 1 plus 4, or root 5. At this point, we already have enough information to classify. What type of angle do we have between our vectors u and v? Acute, obtuse, right? Good, an obtuse angle. The dot product was negative, so that indicates we're going to have an obtuse angle. All right, now let's actually find it. The cosine formula says cosine theta is equal to u dot v divided by the product of the lengths. All right, so we have negative 5 divided by root 10 times root 5, negative 5 over root 50. I can pull a 5 out of the square root, and then it reduces to negative 1 over root 2. All right, so we've got cosine theta equal to minus 1 over root 2. Theta must be cosine inverse of negative 1 over root 2. and that's 3 pi over 4. All right, so we already knew it was an obtuse angle, but now we know exactly what the angle is. It's 3 pi over 4. Let's take a look at a sketch here. We've got the vector 3, 1, and then the vector negative 1, negative 2. It's pretty clear from the picture that the angle between them is obtuse, but now we know exactly what it's equal to, 3 pi over 4. All right, let's do a second example, this time with two vectors in R3. Starting with a dot product. u dot v is 2 times 2 plus 2 times negative 1 plus negative 1 times 2 or zero. What do I know about the angle between u and v? Yeah, theta is 90 degrees or a right angle, good. There's nothing more to do here. We already know that theta is pi over two and these are perpendicular vectors. All right, so from here on, we want to start talking about more general Rn. We've got everything we need in order to describe how close vectors are to each other in Rn. Let's start off with a notion of distance as we know it. If A and B are real numbers, 
then the distance on the number line between A and B is the absolute value of A minus B. You know, a quick example here, we've got the real number line. If A is two and B is five, then you know, the distance between A and B is the absolute value of B minus A, five minus two or three, or the absolute value of A minus B, two minus five or three. We basically take the same idea for distance in Rn. If u and v are vectors in Rn, then the distance between u and v, which we denote dist of u and v, is the length of the vector u minus v. That is, you know, the distance of uv is equal to the length of u minus v. So it's the exact same idea as with real numbers where we took the absolute value of the difference. For real vectors, we take the length of the difference. And same thing here, order doesn't matter. You could also think of that as the length of v minus u. Again, this already coincides with our usual idea of Euclidean distance between points in R2 and R3. We'll see this working through a couple examples. All right, let's find the distance between two vectors 7, 1, and 3, 2 in R2. U minus V, 7, 1 minus 3, 2 is the vector for negative one. And so the distance between u and v, the length of the difference, is a root 16 plus one or root 17. Let's take a look at what's happening here geometrically. All right, so we've got a vector u, which is equal to seven, one, and a vector v equal to three, two. If we take u minus v, we're subtracting v, which is another way of saying add negative v. We add two vectors using the parallelogram law. and their sum lies on the diagonal. All right, but now, the length of this vector u minus v is the same as the length of the vector here directly between the two heads of u and v, because together this makes a nice big parallelogram. All right, so it does coincide with our typical idea of distance between the two vectors. Right, we would think of it as being you know, this distance here between the point at the head of V and the point at the head of U. We're just describing it slightly differently by taking the length of U minus V. All right, let's show it also coincides with our notion of distance in R3 by just looking at two general vectors, U and V in R3 then the distance between u and v all right so this is a good point distance is just a scalar there's no direction for the distance so it's just the the length of the vector u minus v u minus v has a direction right that's why i'm drawing it with an arrow but you're absolutely right once you take the length it becomes a scalar yeah, so distance is just a real number. Good. And it's a non-negative real number. All right, let's take the distance between the two vectors. So the length of the difference, which is the square root of u1 minus v1 squared plus u2 minus v2 squared 
plus u3 minus v3 squared. And this is our usual formula for Euclidean distance. between two points, you know, u and v, with the same coordinates as our vectors. All right, so it aligns with our idea of distance in R3. If we wanted to do a specific example here, we can. Let's take the distance between this particular u and v in R3. It's the square root of negative 1 minus 7 squared plus three minus one squared plus two minus negative five squared. That's root 64 plus four plus 49 or root 17, 117. All right, so that would be the distance between the two vectors. Everything good so far? Should we move on to the last building block here, orthogonality? Our concept of perpendicular vectors, it also extends to higher dimensions. In R2 or R3, we use the cosine formula to see that two vectors are you know, perpendicular if their dot product was zero. The same thing we're going to use for vectors in Rn, you know, even though we don't have that geometric understanding of what that is, we're still going to say they're orthogonal if the dot product is zero. All right, so they're orthogonal or perpendicular if u dot v or u transpose v is equal to zero. In this case, we write u perp v. As a note here, the zero vector is orthogonal to all other vectors, right? because if you take a vector dotted with zero, you always get zero. Right? So even though the zero vector is just a point, we consider it to be orthogonal to any vector. All right, so let's start off with some vectors in R4 and determine which of these are orthogonal. We'll just start going through the dot products. If I take u dot v, that's 2 plus 2 plus 0 minus 4. Are u and v orthogonal? Yeah, that's equal to 0. All right, so u and v are orthogonal. All right, let's go down the line. u dot w is 1 plus 2, minus 3, plus 0. Are u and w orthogonal? Yeah. The dot product is 0 again, so u and w are also orthogonal. And then let's take the remaining pair. v dot w is 2, 1, plus 0, plus 0. Are our last two vectors orthogonal? No, good. The last two, we get a non-zero dot product, and so they're not orthogonal. Let me give you another way of testing for orthogonality. Two vectors u and v are orthogonal if and only if the length of u plus v squared is equal to the length of u squared plus the length of v squared. All right, so let's first prove why that happens if and only if you have orthogonal vectors. Let's look at the length of u plus v squared. That's the dot product of u plus v with itself. I can foil out the dot product just like I would with 
a bunch of polynomials, right? So we have u dot u plus v dot u plus u dot v plus v dot v, right? When I distribute out that dot product. u dot u is the length of u squared. v dot u is the same as u dot v since order doesn't matter. So I'll regroup in the middle as two u dot v. And then the dot product of v with itself is the length of v squared. So here is a general expansion of u plus v squared. Now this equation here is satisfied. u plus v squared is equal to u squared plus length v squared if and only if 2u dot v is equal to zero, right? That middle term has to go away. And that happens if and only if u was orthogonal to v. Right, so we have a second test here for orthogonality. We can either check directly that the dot product of u with v is equal to zero, or we can use this Pythagorean theorem, u plus v squared equal to u squared plus v squared. And let me explain why it's the, called the Pythagorean theorem. If we've got two vectors, u and v, then the length of one side of the triangle is the length of u. Let's make this side of the triangle the length of v. And so the hypotenuse is going to be the square root of the length of u plus the length of v. Okay, that's a good question here. Why would you use the Pythagorean way? Because the dot product way is much easier. You're right. So when you're actually computing, you know, are two vectors orthogonal and you have numbers in hand, the dot product way is much easier. The Pythagorean way is more useful in proofs, right? So when you have two abstract vectors and you want to show that they're orthogonal or not orthogonal, so I think we're gonna make use of this in proofs down the road, right? So it's worth having in hand, but you're right. If you have two vectors with numbers, go ahead and take the dot product. Good point. All right, so let me finish off by extending the notion of orthogonality to not just vectors, but entire subspaces. A vector z is orthogonal to a subspace w if it's orthogonal to every vector in the subspace. So take, for example, z to be you know, e1, 1, 0, and w to be the span of e2. As a picture, z lies on the x-axis. W, the span of zero, one, is the entire y-axis. And now it makes sense that z is going to be orthogonal to any vector that lies on the y-axis. And we can see that pretty quickly. If w is a vector in the subspace w, then w is some scalar multiple of zero, one. So let's say it's zero, c. And now if I take the dot product of z with w, that's one zero dotted with zero c, and that's zero. All right, so z is orthogonal to any vector in the subspace w. And so we say it's orthogonal to w itself. And now we can talk about the largest subspace that's orthogonal. 
the orthogonal complement of a subspace W is the subspace consisting of every vector that is orthogonal to W. And we denote the orthogonal complement by taking W and then the little perpendicular sign as a superscript. All right, so let's take a look at one example here. If I consider a plane through the origin in R3, here's some plane W. And then I look at a line L also passing through the origin. That's orthogonal to W. So if I take any vector here in W, it's going to make a right angle with the line. Then any vector that lies on the line is orthogonal to vectors in W. And any vector that lies on the plane is going to be orthogonal to the vectors on the line. The orthogonal complement of the plane is the line. And the orthogonal complement of the line is the plane. If you have a one dimensional object, a line, and you take all of the possible things orthogonal to it, it's going to map out a plane in R3. And on the other hand, if you have a 2D, a plane in R3, and you map out everything that's orthogonal to the plane, it's going to be a line. All right, so these are each other's orthogonal complements. All right, so this brings me to the big theorem for this section that I wanted to get to, which is that if A is an M by N matrix, then the orthogonal complement of the column space of A transpose is equal to the null space of A. And the orthogonal complement of the column space of A is equal to the null space of A transpose. This gives us a relationship between the important subspaces associated with our matrix. And we always knew we had a null space and a column space, but they are related in this very special way, you know, that they are the orthogonal complements of each other as long as you have you know, the right dimensions. So you might have to transpose you know, one or the other. All right, so let's prove one case and then I'll, I think I'll pick up here next time. Let's let Z be any vector in the null space of A transpose, which means A transpose Z is equal to zero. And consider any vector in the column space of A. This is a linear combination. A X of the columns of A. Let's show that the two are orthogonal. Take the dot product of Z with this vector from the column space AX, Z transpose AX. We want to show that's zero. I'm going to regroup by taking Z transpose AX instead. And then rewrite this as A transpose Z X transpose since the transpose of a product is the product of the transposes, but in the opposite order. But now Z is in the null space of A transpose. So we've got the zero vector. And the zero vector dotted with anything is zero. 
All right, so we've done enough to show that any vector in the null space is orthogonal to vectors in the column space. I'm gonna leave off here. Next class, we'll start off by showing that these are the only vectors orthogonal to the column space. And so we have the orthogonal complement. And then we didn't quite get to the punchline for today. So I guess that's where we'll start off on Monday. Anybody have questions before you go? You can definitely do the homework at this point. You don't need the last five minutes of lecture to do the homework. Okay. All right, so I will see you back Monday. Everyone enjoy your weekends.